We're here today to speak on the new evangelization, but specifically how to live it out in the family, the family fully alive in our Lord. The new evangelization begins at home. That's the theme. But in order to really approach this properly, I think we need to take a step back and put it in perspective and get a sense of timing, if you will, because for us as Catholics, timing is important. Well, that's true for humans in general. Timing is everything, they say. But right now we can see, for example, 10 years ago, the passing of the torch from now St. John Paul II to Pope Benedict. And this is so much of what the new evangelization is about because John Paul was the one who coined the phrase. And Benedict is the one who established not only a new dicastery in the Roman Curia, the congregation for promoting the new evangelization, but basically encouraged every bishop in every diocese in every parish to make that such a high priority. But really we need to take a step back even further in order to appreciate where we are as Catholics in history because we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the climax and conclusion of the Second Vatican Council. You go back to 1965 and this great event that produced so many rich documents that called for the renewal of the church was very significant for the new evangelization. When you look at the documents and the teaching of Vatican II and compare it to Vatican I, there is no break, there is no rupture, the way people often made it seem way back in the 60s and 70s. But the fact is, there is something that is truly distinctive in Vatican II that you don't really find much in Vatican I. It's the same faith, for sure, but the emphasis on evangelization is distinctive. The term evangelium occurs once in the documents of Vatican I back in 1870. 71. And it's only used with reference to the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In contrast, when you read the documents of Vatican II, derivatives of evangelium, to evangelize, evangelizing, evangelization, those terms occur more than 200 times. 206, if my count is accurate, which is arguably more than in all of the previous 21 ecumenical councils held in the church. This was something that the Holy Spirit impressed upon the bishops who convened in those years. And of course, you remember that St. John the 23rd was the Pope who convened the council back in 62. But then he died after the first session and was succeeded by then Cardinal Montini who took the name Pope Paul VI, now blessed as of last October. He was beatified. But when he was asked, why did you choose the name Paul? Because that hadn't been used by a Pope for hundreds of years. He specified his motivation. He said, because I want to pattern my ministry as Pope after the Apostle of the Gentiles, which he began to do by becoming the very first Pope in history to make apostolic journeys to other continents for the purpose of evangelizing, proclaiming the gospel. He did it even before Vatican II was over in 65 by going to the Holy Land as a pilgrim in 64, but to preach the gospel as well. And then before Vatican II was over in 65, he came to America, the first pope in history to come to our shores, and he preached the gospel in New York City and at the United Nations as well. In 66 and 67, after the council was over, he traveled to Portugal and then Turkey, in 68 to Colombia, in 69 to Uganda, and then 1970 turned out to be the banner year where he traveled to Iran, to Pakistan, preaching the gospel there, the Philippines, West Samoa, Australia, Indonesia, Hong Kong, and Sri Lanka. Now all of these amazing exploits are practically forgotten because of the way his successor traveled. Now St. John Paul II made over a hundred apostolic journeys, clocking in well over a million kilometers. But Paul VI is the one who established this whole new way of ministry, and he did it for the purpose of evangelizing the modern world. By 1970, as he was getting older, he admitted he couldn't travel anymore. Only last fall did we find out really why he stopped traveling. Because on his last trip when he went to the Philippines, he kept it private. There was an assassination attempt. He was stabbed once and then twice. And then as the would-be assassin was about to plunge into his heart, they stopped him. Nobody even knew. There was no reports. 
that when he was beatified last fall, this aged nun brought out the vestment that was blood-stained because she reported that he insisted upon proclaiming the gospel anyway. He only wanted to spend a couple of hours in recovery. That's the kind of man he was. But by 1971, he could no longer travel. But he kept emphasizing evangelizing. In fact, he convened the bishops in Rome for over a month back in 74 and asked them, devise new ways to evangelize the modern world. And then he published a document in 1975, Evangelii Nunciandi in Latin, on evangelization in the modern world. It turned out to be the single most influential document of his whole ministry. And in it, he's very clear about his purpose. He says, and this is the thesis statement, <coughs> evangelization is in fact the grace and vocation proper to the church, her deepest identity. She exists in order to evangelize, to be the channel of the gift of grace to reconcile sinners with God and to perpetuate Christ's sacrifice in the mass which is the memorial of his death and glorious resurrection, close quote. Notice two things. First, the Pope identifies the church's very purpose with proclaiming the gospel, with evangelizing. Second, this is inseparable from what we do in every mass. The holy sacrifice of the mass is not something that is separate from our task of evangelization. I'm gonna to return to that second point later on after lunch, but I wanna focus on this first point of evangelization because this is so much at the heart of what has been happening for the last 50 years. And once again, I think we need to develop more of a sense of timing to see just how momentous this time in history is because, you know, it is often the case that you're too close to something significant to recognize its significance. A little perspective is sometimes needed, a sense of timing as well. You know, Father Connor mentioned that uh, we've been married now 35 years. We're going to be celebrating our 36th anniversary. But I remember how we celebrated our fifth anniversary. Kimberly and I were not able to go out to a restaurant. We went to the hospital instead because on our fifth anniversary, our second son, Gabriel, was born. Now, when our 10th anniversary rolled around, we were sort of wanting to celebrate in a greater way. And so we hoped to sleep in and then maybe go to a restaurant later on that day. But sleeping in was not to be because there was an argument downstairs. And so when I went downstairs, our two sons, Michael and Gabriel, were arguing, sounding like anything but archangels. <laughs> and I'm like, what's going on? It's his birthday. Back off, Michael. And he says, no, Dad, you got to stop him. And I'm like, stop him. It's his birthday. Stop him from what? And Mike said, Dad, he's going all over the neighborhood telling everybody that you and Mom were born on the same day that he was born on the same day that you and mom got married. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> uh, no, no, Gabriel, you were born on the same date, but not the same day. <laughs> but to a five-year-old, what difference does a distinction make between day and date? I said, for the sake of your mother, cease and desist, you know. <laughs> and so it is. When we develop a sense of timing, we're able to recognize not only anniversaries, but those milestones that they represent. Because when you look at what Pope Paul VI did, you can appreciate even more what St. John Paul II continued, because as much as Paul emphasized evangelization, he never used the phrase new evangelization. That was reserved for his successor. And so when John Paul II became Pope in 78. He began making apostolic journeys almost immediately. But the first time he used the phrase new evangelization was within that first year, when he went back to his own homeland of Poland. And there he could see in those nine days that changed the world. That's the title of the documentary that tells the story of his visit there. He could see the ravages of German Nazism, of Soviet communism, he had more perspective from Rome as to the effects of secularization upon his own homeland, his own countrymen. And so in an unscripted moment, when he went back to Krakow, where he had been as archbishop for years, he was invited to speak at Nova Huta, this town that the Marxists had designed to be a kind of worker's paradise for all of the factory workers and their families. And why? Because it was this new well, it's entitled Nova Huta, which means new steelworks, 
but there were no churches allowed, which was part of the paradisical aspect for the communists. But of course, when he was the bishop of Krakow, he would actually celebrate the mass on Christmas Eve out on the hillside until he had successfully pressured the communist authorities to allow a church to be built. But he was back there at Nova Huta, looking out at the faces of the thousands of fellow Poles when he suddenly used the phrase new evangelization. It wasn't in the rough draft. It ended up being published later on. But when he went on to explain what he meant by new evangelization, he clarified that the church never stopped evangelizing. So the new evangelization is not as though we're starting up again something that we had ceased. The new evangelization, he explained, is necessary to re-evangelize the de-Christianized, to evangelize the baptized who have grown up in a post-Christian age. And so he used that phrase in 79, and then he didn't use the phrase again for another four years. When he came to America, when he returned in 83, he was speaking to the bishops of North, Central, and South America in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And he had been here once, twice, and when he came back, he could see that apart from the Nazis and apart from the Soviets, the ravages of materialism, consumerism, and secularization had had a similar effect in the Americas. And so what did he call for? When addressing the bishops back in 83, he said, what we need is a new evangelization. And once again, he went on to clarify that what is new about the new evangelization is not that the church is going to send missionaries out to the four corners where people have never heard of Jesus, but rather, he said, the new evangelization is about re-evangelizing the de-Christianized. And on that occasion, he made it perfectly clear this was not just a side issue. This was going to become the top priority in his own pontificate. In fact, later on, after that announcement, he clarified that there would be a sort of semi-official launch for the new evangelization. But it wouldn't be right away. It would come in 1992. And when asked why he was waiting, he explained, because 1992 would, would mark the 500th anniversary of what? The founding and the first evangelizing of the Americas. You go back to 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, what were the most populous Catholic countries in the world back then? They were Spain and Italy and France. You fast forward five centuries and what are they today? In first place, Brazil, in second place, Mexico, and in third place, our own United States. Countries that didn't even exist 500 years ago are now the single most populous Catholic countries in the world, and the ones that once were are struggling to recover even a small sense of that legacy that they have lost. The question that he was putting to the Americas, and especially the U.S., was where will you be in five centuries? But even more, what are you going to do with this great gift that you have in the grace of the gospel? Are you going to lose it, or are you going to recover it? And so as the year 92 approached, he began doing more and more to prepare. For example, in 1990, he published Redemptoris Missio, the mission of the Redeemer, which became known as the Magna Carta of the new evangelization. He stated his thesis, just like Paul VI did, with clarity and urgency. He says, and I quote, I sense that the moment has come to commit all of the church's energies to the new evangelization. No believer in Christ, no institution of the church can avoid this supreme duty to proclaim Christ to all peoples. Now, this is not a man given to overstatement or hyperbole. He said what he meant. He meant what he said. I sense that the moment has come to commit all of the church's energies to the new evangelization. No believer in Christ, no institution of the church can avoid this supreme duty. This isn't just for the missionaries. It's not just for the clergy. It's not just for the religious. It's for each and every one of us, and there are no exemptions being issued here. And as preparation for this great event in 92 and beyond, he announced in the early 90s that the next World Youth Day would be held in Denver, Colorado, of all places. His closest advisors urged him to reconsider because all of the previous World Youth Days had been such successes because, as they thought, they were held in majority Catholic countries with a majority Catholic population. Rome, Buenos Aires, Santiago de Compostela, Czestochowa, Poland. Whereas America is so secular. And what do young people in America care about what an aging pontiff has to say to them? 
But he wouldn't reconsider. He went ahead with it anyway. And journalists admitted that when they came to Denver back in 93, they'd already drafted articles that described the abysmal failure, the, 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 the low turnout. But in fact, what happened? Well, one journalist named Randall Meason describes what it was like in the journalist box to see the helicopter of John Paul coming over Cherry Creek Park and then later Mile High Stadium, where it was visibly buffeted, not by winds, but by the forceful applause and the cheers and the crowd crying out to him, where over a million young people gathered to celebrate the gospel and to hear all about the new evangelization and suddenly Denver was transformed into the fountainhead of grace for the new evangelization, not just in Colorado, but throughout America. And not just in Denver, but this is true across the country and around the world. The new evangelization was launched in a way that was truly grace-filled. And it was an amazing and extraordinary event. Like a lot of people, I assumed that the 90s represented the decade of the new evangelization as a preparation for the great jubilee, the year 2000, when we would enter a new century, a whole new millennium. And so we thought this was a preparation. And a number of people spoke that way. But when you go back and look carefully at what John Paul described the 90s, he never called it the decade of the new evangelization. What he called it was the advent season of the new evangelization. Well, what does that imply? Well, Advent season is, as you know, the first four Sundays in the liturgical year. But after Advent is over, what remains? 48 more Sundays. So when the decade of the 90s was done, was the new evangelization over? It had barely begun. This was clearly not a sprint, but a, a marathon. This was not a short-term policy. This was a long-term mission. And many people didn't recognize it. But one person who did was then Cardinal Ratzinger. And when he became Pope Benedict, he made it very clear that this was going to be a century-long mission to re-evangelize the de-Christianized people. Now, when people heard this, there was some reluctance. There was some resistance. You know, evangelical Catholic? It sounded like an oxymoron to most people. You're either an evangelical or you're a Catholic. It's like being a married bachelor. You're one or the other, you can't be both. For John Paul, it was a virtual redundancy. To be a Catholic is to share the good news. And so to evangelize is part of what it really means to be a Catholic and a really important part of that as well. Now, you know, when you talk to ordinary Catholics though, there is some resistance and you can see why because we tend to associate evangelizing in America with what? Well, with fundamentalists who can be somewhat anti-intellectual and at times anti-Catholic and sometimes manipulative. And besides, there are all the scandals of the televangelists for the last 20 or 30 years. But the fact is, you don't really grasp something just simply by learning it as a kid and believing it because you know you have to. I know when I went through school, and then college and seminary. I got great grades, but I didn't learn something. I didn't learn until I taught. Because when you teach something, when you share it with others, that's when it really becomes your own. And, and so what I would propose to you <coughs> is that this is the thing that we need the most. That is to enter into the new evangelization. Not just to reach them, but to recognize the fact that we are them, that we need the grace of the gospel. We need to be awakened ourselves. Now, some people say, well, you know, I will evangelize, but I'm gonna do it not through words, but deeds, not through, you know, what I say, but how I live, so that people can look at my life. And, and don't get me wrong, the witness of the life is just as important as words, and sometimes even more important. But these people are, are, are fond of quoting St. Francis of Assisi, who was famously said to have remarked to his friars, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, what? Use words. Now, I teach at Franciscan University. I'm surrounded by Franciscans, some of whom are professional Franciscan historians. They'll tell you what they've told me, and that is, you can look in the records and all of the archives. There's no proof that he ever actually said those words. 
It's sort of like a medieval urban myth, I suppose, but the fact is, if anybody lived a life that was upright enough not to need words, it was St. Francis, and yet he shared through words all the time. The Catechism is very clear. In paragraph 905, lay people fulfill their prophetic mission by evangelizing. That is the proclamation of Jesus Christ by word as well as the testimony of life. The witness of life is not the only element. The true apostle was on the lookout for occasions of announcing Christ by word to unbelievers or to the faithful. Because the faithful, the catechism makes clear, need to hear the gospel again and again and respond in new ways. And so it is that the new evangelization established by John Paul, taken up to the next level by Pope Benedict, has now been made the highest priority by far by Pope Francis. I mean, I would define Pope Francis, and I would describe him as the, the new evangelization in high definition. A friend of mine says, no, he's the, the new evangelization on steroids. <laughs> well, however you describe him, I think it's clear that he gets it and that he shares it and that he is calling us to it because what in fact was his very first publication, Evangelii, Nun, Evangelii Gaudium, which was the joy of the gospel. And what was he doing in World Youth Day down in Rio last year? He was making the new evangelization just as important as John Paul and Benedict and even more so. But he was also showing young people how it is that you can evangelize and be evangelized. He offered them what he offers us, and that is, I think, the key to the new evangelization. And what is it? Well, what's the title of the document? The Joy of the Gospel. And he made it very clear to the millions down in Rio. He said to them, and I quote, evangelization in our time will only take place as the result of joy, contagious joy. And he goes on to describe how joy is what makes our faith infectious to other people. It's a healthy sort of infectious faith, he says. And then he goes on to say this, the joy of the gospel arises from a heart which in its weakness rejoices and marvels at the works of God, just like the heart of Our Lady, whom all generations call blessed, the cause of our joy. And he illustrates this by showing how the Blessed Virgin goes to the Judean hill country to her kinswoman Elizabeth, and what happens? The baby, John the Baptist, leaps for joy in utero, apart from whatever was said. Just the presence of Christ that we bring to others causes joy. And so it is, I'm convinced that he has shown us a practical way that we can evangelize. He's handed us what I would call the master key to the new evangelization. And why? Because even if you can't defend the faith or explain every doctrine or prove it all from the Bible, the one thing you can do is this, enjoy being Catholic. Enjoy being Catholic. That's the best way to evangelize family members and friends, neighbors and coworkers and everybody else. Why? Because the world offers us countless pleasures, but no lasting joys, whereas Jesus Christ gives to us joy, even in the midst of hardship. Sometimes we're able to enjoy life through our faith in him, through suffering, and yet the fact is, joy is the one thing we all want. Joy is what we need. And joy is what other people are going to find irresistible, more irrefutable than any argument you give them or any proof text from the Bible you might deploy. And as Pope Francis reminds us, when we find ourselves without joy, which is something I do just about every morning when I awaken, it's simply God's gentle way of reminding us that we ourselves need to be re-evangelized. We need to hear the gospel and receive Christ in new ways. I would propose to you that this may be the single greatest discovery I made in becoming a Catholic. I always assumed I understood what it meant to evangelize, what it meant to experience conversion. It's what happened to me when I was 14, as a troubled teenager in the juvenile court system, as a delinquent. I found Jesus, or really he found me, and I experienced conversion. And my parents were glad and relieved. Or conversion is what happened to me at the Easter Vigil in 1986 when I entered the Catholic Church. You know, these mountain peak moments in the past, but the fact is, what John Paul pointed out is that in our tradition, conversion is ongoing. It's lifelong. And in fact, it's daily. 
And it never gets easy. And it never becomes unnecessary. What does Jesus say? If any man would follow me, he must take up his, his rosary beads. <laughs> no, I wish he had said that. Taking up a cross every day is never going to start getting easy. And so for us, opening our hearts to the grace of conversion in an ongoing, lifelong, ever-deepening way is precisely how we grow in virtue and grow in holiness and grow in our own enjoyment of what it means to be a child of God the Father, a member of a divine family. Because it's not just a set of beliefs that we have to subscribe to. It isn't simply a bunch of practices that we have to do. It isn't a contract but a covenant. It is not a factory but a family. And when we recognize this, we begin to recognize also the fact that we are called to a maturity that comes through difficulty, but it brings a deepening of joy. Now, again, evangelizing for me as an evangelical Protestant was something that was simple. What I discovered, though, that is for us Catholics, it's, it's a different sort of thing. I remember back in 92 when the new evangelization was being officially launched, John Paul published an article in the official Vatican newspaper, L'Observatore Romano, and it was simply entitled, Base the New Evangelization on the Eucharist. I remember hearing that thinking, you know, what does that mean? Because I had been a Catholic at that point for over five years, but I'd been an evangelical for a lot longer. And I had been evangelized back when I was 14 years old, and it was a rather simple matter. The fellow who did it took no more than five minutes. He went through what we call the four spiritual laws. I didn't know it at the time, but I learned them later on. Number one, he said, God loves you, Scott. Number two, you've sinned and fallen short of that love. Number three, Christ died for that sin. And so forth and finally, you've got to decide what to do with that gift. Because if you give your life to Jesus like he gave his life to you, you can have a personal relationship with Christ. You can experience the grace of salvation. And I decided to make that commitment. I made a decision of faith. And he led me in prayer. We called it the sinner's prayer. I didn't learn it until later on what he was doing. But once I experienced it, then I turned around and learned that I could share the gospel. I could evangelize in any setting. That's what we were taught. You know, I was on an airplane last night, descending. And in the last few minutes, I began to talk to the fellow next to me. Well, we were taught that you could share the gospel as you're landing on the tarmac. You could turn and say, do you know God loves you? Do you know that you've sinned like me and fallen short of that? But thirdly, Christ has died for that sin, so finally, you've got to decide what to do. You could do it on an airplane, you could do it in an elevator if you've got three or four floors. By the time the doors open, you walk out into the lobby, you've shared the four spiritual laws, you could lead them in the sinner's prayer, but the one thing you couldn't do is to say amen and then say, let's go and make sure that you receive First Holy Communion. He wouldn't be ready for the Eucharist yet. And so I began to wonder, how can evangelization be Eucharistic. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. But he wasn't the only one saying it back then. Besides Pope John Paul, Cardinal George gave a talk that I heard back then, and he said, all evangelizers proclaim Christ, Catholic evangelizers proclaim a Eucharistic Christ. More recently, Archbishop Gomez has said the same thing, that our evangelization must be intensely Eucharistic. And so I began to look for an explanation. What does that mean? Well, when you hear the four spiritual laws as a Catholic, there is not a single one of them that you disagree with. But that is what we call initial evangelization. That, those are like the first four steps that you take. And when you get somebody to pray the sinner's prayer, they have made a significant step. But it's more like the first step taken by the prodigal son on the long journey back home to the father's house. Because there are a lot of other steps that need to follow that we weren't aware of. And so instead of a sprint, this too is like a marathon. It isn't over and done in a day, but it can, be, it can get started in a day. It needs to be begun in any kind of setting where we find ourselves. But I want to propose to you that what we're talking about here is a personal relationship. It is a friendship. But it's also more than that. But it has to be at least that. Friendship. This, in fact, is the second key that... Pope Francis 
and Benedict and John Paul have identified along with joy. And no wonder, because what did Jesus tell his disciples the night he was in the upper room with them? The night that he instituted the Eucharist, the night before he died for them on the cross. He said, I no longer call you servants. Literally, I no longer call you slaves because the slave doesn't know what the master is doing. I now call you what? Friends. Friendship, Pope Francis has identified as the key along with joy. Friendship with God, friendship with Christ, a personal relationship is where we need to begin and we need to return to that over and over again. Friendship with God is the message, but friendship also has to become the medium. In other words, well, you, you think back to the 60s when TV was really taking hold. Marshall McLuhan, the great media expert and convert to the Catholic faith, made famous the phrase, the medium is the message. Well, this is true here as well, because if the message is friendship with God, then the medium, the way that we communicate that message has got to be friendship as well. And so it isn't just enough to go through four lines. You've got to enter into friendship. You've got to be able to share what it is you enjoy. And this is what I think makes it possible for us as Catholics to evangelize. Because let's face it, most of you are never going to end up, you know, giving a homily or even giving a talk at North American Martyrs like the one I'm doing right now. Most of you will probably never write a book or an article explaining the gospel. But the one thing you have is family. The one thing you enjoy are friendships. And the fact is, a lot of people you know, a lot of friends that you have, a lot of people you work with, might never darken the doorways of North American martyrs or whatever parish you might happen to belong to. The fact is, your life might be the only homily they ever hear. Your friendship with them might be the only way they ever discover the grace and the good news of Christ. And what it means, not just to be a sinner who's pardoned, but adopted into the family of God and shown that the Creator and the God of the universe is Abba Father, and that He has sent His Son to make us His sons and daughters and brothers and sisters who enter into a kind of family bond of true friendship. Because that's what friendship is. It's sort of like taking the great times that you've had in family with brothers and sisters and extending them out in all directions to others as well. This is how we share the Gospel, through joy and friendship. Picture yourself at work next week on Monday morning and the coffee break rolls around. It's about 10 a.m. and you're over by the water cooler. Nobody's going to think you're weird if suddenly you mention the fact that, you know, last weekend I went to this movie on Friday night and I really recommend it. You know, it might be like Little Boy that's coming out here in the next few weeks. I recommend that. Nobody's going to say, who do you think you are to impose your theatrical taste on the rest of us? they might take note and go the next night or the following weekend. And if you go on to mention the fact that, you know, before we went out to the movie, we went to this new restaurant that just opened and we really enjoyed the cuisine, I really recommend this particular dish, nobody's going to lash out and say, stop shoving your culinary taste down our throats. And not, why wouldn't they? Because that's what friends do. And that's what we enjoy at work with co-workers who share their own experiences of what it is they enjoy. And so if you could say in an honest and transparent moment, not in a manipulative way, in some setting where you've been praying for your co-workers, you know, I grew up Catholic, but for years I just kind of drifted. I took it for granted. But lately, I've really been enjoying what it means to be a Catholic. Now, chances are they're not going to say, oh, there are four minutes left in the coffee break. Preach it, sister. You know. <laughs> but later on that morning, you might be asked out to lunch. Later in the week, you might see them at the soccer field. The fact is, when we share the joys of life with people who we work with, that's how we express friendship. That's how we strengthen friendship. And that's also how we communicate the truth of what it means to be a Catholic Christian, to enter into the family of God, to share friendship with God and with all of our brothers and sisters as well. And that's what the Eucharist represents. It represents a covenant bond that begins with a personal relationship, but it doesn't end there. And this is why evangelizing for us as Catholics is something that we need to begin, but it's not over and done in a day. It's something that takes place over days, weeks, months, and years because it's a friendship. And even more, it's a covenant. 
And so when you read the catechism, you can hear this. This is one of those places where the new evangelization has a lot to learn from the old evangelization. And what do I mean? Well, in the catechism, paragraph 1229, we read that becoming a Christian is accomplished as a journey in several stages in which certain essential elements have to be present. First of all, the proclamation of the word and acceptance of the gospel, which entails initial conversion. Secondly, the profession of faith, which is the creed and the prayer, the Our Father and all of that. Thirdly, baptism itself, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, admission to Eucharistic communion. What is this paragraph talking about? The way evangelization was done in the ancient church. You go back to the first century and what did Jesus do? He chose mostly Palestinian Jewish fishermen. For what purpose? To make disciples of all nations. At what point in history when there was a Roman Empire? Talk about your culture of death. What are the chances that a few Galilean fishermen are going to be able to transform the imperial Roman civilization? A culture of death, a military machine, and yet against all odds, within three or four centuries, through the proclamation of the gospel, through the witness of one's lives, the martyrs and all of that, even agnostic historians acknowledge the transformation produced what is now called Christendom. It was flawed, it wasn't a perfect culture, but it was a radically Christianized society. And how did it happen? Well, this is what the paragraph is describing. Because in the beginning, you would preach the gospel, and when people heard it and believed it, they were described as converts, but if they were really serious, they had to prove it by becoming catechumens. They would go through not only being evangelized, but being catechized. And the catechizing took place when you learned the Apostles' Creed, when you learned the seven petitions of the Our Father, when you began to learn the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. And after evangelizing and then catechizing, then came sacramentalizing. That's when you were baptized. That's when you were confirmed. That's when you received the Holy Eucharist for the first time. It's interesting because in paragraph 1617, this is also echoed where we read that the entire Christian life bears the mark of Christ's spousal love for the church. When you're baptized and enter the people of God, it is a nuptial mystery. It is, so to speak, the nuptial bath which precedes the wedding feast, the Eucharist, which is the marriage supper of the Lamb. What is the catechism doing? It's echoing the three stages of the old evangelization and recognizing that when you're evangelized, then you need to be catechized, but when you're catechized, you then need to be sacramentalized. But you also have to recognize the need to re-evangelize those who are sacramentalized. But the metaphor, the analogy that is employed here consistently is what? Marriage, the nuptial bond, the marital covenant. And I can relate to that because, you know, I go back about 36 or 37 years and I remember on campus being smitten by this gorgeous gal named Kimberly. And I kept running into her in the library, in the mailroom, in the cafeteria, outside her class. Even in the lobby of the girls' dorm, she couldn't imagine what I was doing there, but <laughs> her roommate had given me her schedule. These were none, were pure coincidences. I finally asked her out on a date, and that's when we had a personal relationship. But that wasn't the goal, that wasn't my end game. We went out several times, and I was falling for her, and I could tell that she was enjoying it too. And so this period of courtship kept growing, a personal relationship. We were falling in love. And then we crossed the threshold on the evening of January 23rd, in the lightly falling snow, on Rainbow Bridge over Wolf Creek, where I got down on my knees and I pulled out the ring and I popped the question. I like to say that in the Gospels, Jesus gave sight to the blind, but that night, he took sight away from she who could see. She accepted my proposal and the ring right on the spot. We hugged and we kissed and we danced across Rainbow Bridge. And to celebrate, I took her out to Mr. Donut. <laughs> Cheapskate. <laughs> we had moved beyond courtship into engagement. And this is what, you know, falling in love and then growing in love and then entering into a commitment of love. This is where I also learned another life lesson that you've heard before. When you marry a gal, you don't just marry her, you marry her whole family. Well, that's when I got to meet her parents and her siblings and all of the others. Yikes, what am I getting myself into? It's a whole lot more than a personal relationship. It's an interpersonal family bond. 
But in my case, I was so clearly marrying up, I knew it was a good thing. But that wasn't the goal. The goal was really on August 18th of 1979, where 35 years ago, we didn't just tie a knot. We didn't just seal a deal. We didn't just, you know, enter a contract. We celebrated a covenant. In fact, we entered into a sacrament that we didn't understand until years later, and we're still growing in our understanding of it. But this is the way evangelizing takes place in the Catholic tradition. It is about courtship, it is about engagement, but it is also about a covenant bond of interpersonal communion. Evangelizing, where you fall in love with our Lord and enter a personal relationship. Catechizing, where you then really learn that this is a family, that God is my Father, that Christ is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, that the saints and the angels are like older siblings who are home, who are praying for us to get there and to become holy in the process. But ultimately, it's really about entering into these sacraments, which are not rituals that we do for God as much as they are powerful works that God does for us to give us what we need, to make up for what we lack. And so evangelizing, catechizing, and sacramentalizing, it's like courtship, engagement, and marriage. But just as we catechize and sacramentalize those who are evangelized, we can also see the need to re-evangelize those who are sacramentalized. Because let's face it, the analogy works in the other direction as well. How many people do we know who are married and yet unhappy? Who have been married for years and yet feel alone? Sometimes estranged, sometimes hurt, deeply wounded, unable to forgive, unable to be reconciled. And so as we need to re-evangelize the baptized, we also need to recognize that marriage is the context in which the new evangelization is going to take place. For most of our culture, marriage is now no longer what it was. It isn't a divine institution. It is not a sacrament. It is basically a convention that can be redefined at the will of a majority or of a judge in a federal court. The fact is, if our lives are the only homilies people will ever hear, our marriages might be the only way that people come to understand that a personal relationship is not the goal or the end game. It's where you begin. But at the same time, as you move from courtship through engagement to marriage, you also recognize the need to renew the wellspring. You need to recognize why it is that friendship and a personal relationship can be lost even in a covenant bond. And so it is. When I think back to the way it was when we first got married, it was like springtime, that engagement. And then when we got married, it was like summer. It was nice and hot, but I won't go into the details for the sake of discretion. <laughs> but I'll be honest, later on, when I got a full-time job and I began to study and things kept coming up Catholic, it turned into fall. When I became a Catholic and she didn't, it became winter. And it was like a long, hard, cold winter, like the ones we're finally getting out of here. I became a Catholic in 86. She didn't enter the church until 1990, and for most of those years, I wasn't sure she ever would. And when she finally did, it was like springtime returning. We really celebrated a reunion. It was a glorious homecoming of sorts. But at the same time, what we discovered after she came into the church was that in our marriage, we had developed some bad habits. We had some real poor communication. We had some wounds. And so we took some advice, and I would encourage you to consider it as well. We went to a good Catholic marriage counselor. I went alone, she went alone, then we, we went together. And for weeks, for months, he would ask me questions about what happened. He would ask me questions about the way it was. You know, where were you when you first kissed her? Where were you when you told her you loved her? What was the first song you danced to? What was the first movie you saw? And then by the end, he was sort of like saying, go back to that theater, go back to that restaurant, go back and dance to You're Still the One by Orleans, go back and renew the wellsprings. And we did. And over the course of time, it really made a difference. We entered back into that depth of a friendship that is more than a personal relationship, it is covenant communion, that is life-giving as well. And I want to propose to you that marriage as a sacrament is a sacrament precisely because God is the one who administers this through me to her, through her to me, in order to convince me that he can empower me to give me what I need, to make up for what I lack. 
And in the process, I'd like to say that ever since that time, it's been nothing but summer ever since. But the fact is, our marriage, like most marriages that we know from friends of ours, it's continued to go through seasons of life, through ups and downs, where we need to continually go back and renew the wellspring. This is why I'm convinced that the new evangelization is going to take place not primarily in the homilies you hear, much less the ones you never give, or the books that people write, but in the friendships where joy is experienced, in the marriages where the sorrows and the hardships of life end up deepening our capacity to not only forgive but to apologize and to fall back in love again and again and to give the other a chance, a second chance, a tenth chance, a fortieth chance like God has done with us. So often we tell ourselves it's all right to kind of withhold forgiveness, to bear a grudge, and yet if the God of the universe was not only willing to forgive us, but dying on the cross to do so, then just who do we think we are to withhold forgiveness from a spouse in a sacrament? What are we saying? Well, God has his standards and he's holy, but I have higher ones. That isn't safe. That isn't right. That is insane. And so what we see in this new evangelization is an opportunity to not only discover that Christ is the bridegroom of our soul, that the church is the bride and the family of Christ, but that we have a chance to live it out in practical daily ways. Recently, before he resigned, Pope Benedict said this, and I quote, the union of man and woman, they're becoming one flesh in love, in fruitful love, is a sign that speaks of God with such force and eloquence, which in our day has become greater because unfortunately, for various reasons, marriage is going through a profound crisis. And then he goes on to draw this link between the crisis in faith and the crisis in marriage, and he concludes that marriage is called to be not only an object, but a subject of the new evangelization. We've got to go back and rediscover what marriage is. It is not man-made, it is God-given. And it goes back to creation. It's the primordial form of what it means to bear God's image and likeness. It is the means by which we discover that the God of the universe created us for love. That it's not a contract, but a covenant. It's not a factory, but a family. And that the love between a man and a woman in this covenant of marriage, in this sacrament, is itself life-giving in a completely unique way. Or as we like to put it, when the two become one, the one we became was so real that nine months later we had to come up with a name. <laughs> and our firstborn Michael was the incarnation, not only of our love, but of our oneness. And now six kids and 11 grandkids later, we have discovered, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, through good times and bad, what it means for God to be faithful and to give us what we need to make up for what we lack. And in the process, I would also say this, he has convinced me that he can do it in anybody else's life as well. I don't wanna go into any of the details here, perhaps Kimberly could later, but at one point in our marriage, I had a close friend who was seriously counseling her to consider divorcing me. He was a Protestant minister, he was a classmate, he had been my best friend. I didn't know it until about a year later. All she was looking for from him was not advice to get divorced, but help in refuting all of my Catholic arguments. One year later, he had been reading all of the things that I had recommended to her that she had told him about, and he called to apologize for telling her that she ought to consider divorcing me. And she also, he also called to tell me that the books that she had recommended he had been reading and he became convinced that the Catholic faith was right. I found it much easier to forgive him at that moment. <laughs> he ended up becoming a Catholic. He ended up becoming a professor of scripture at Mount St. Mary's Seminary. Bill and Lee Son went through a hard time in their marriage. But what I discovered in the process of going through this time is that God can reach us no matter where we are. He'll stoop however low he has to go. He'll raise us back to where we were but we have had 35 years of a friendship, the likes of which I never imagined to be possible. I didn't know that a married couple could experience joy and friendship the way God has lavished it upon me through her. People read her books, they, you'll hear her talk and you'll say, she's amazing. And all I can say is you have no idea how amazing she is. 
But she is amazing, as she will testify, because of God's grace. His amazing grace has made her an amazing wife and an amazing mom and an amazing mother-in-law and now a grandmother as well. But she has flaws, real flaws, almost half as many as her husband. (laughs) Sometimes they're all I can see. (laughs) And then God shows me mine and then the mercy of Christ. This is where we are. This is who we are and this is why The new evangelization is not some unattainable ideal. It is not simply ecclesiastical jargon. It is not just for the clergy or for the missionaries or for professional evangelizers. It's for each and every single one of us. And as I said before, it's not just that we're out to reach them. We are them. Christ is trying to reach us where we are, in our homes, at work, but especially in our marriages. And this is where the Eucharist as the marriage supper of the Lamb can give us not only a sense of God's romantic and mad love for us, but it can also enable us to extend it to others, most especially that other, that beloved daughter of God that he has entrusted to me in this consecrated relationship. And I'd like to say after I step down that our marriage is just going to be endless summer, but you know as well as I do that we're going to go through other seasons too, like you will. We've got to pray for each other. We've got to encourage each other. But in the process, we've also got to make this believable to a culture. We won't do it through politicians. We won't do it through judges. As important as it is to be socially involved, the way that we can convince the world that marriage is what God has defined it to be is by living it out in a unique and life-giving way. I remember I was a doctoral student in Milwaukee back in the days when it was Monsignor Bruskowitz, my pastor, who I was seeing as he prepared to welcome me home into the Catholic Church. I heard this Jesuit theologian who is also a trained attorney in a graduate course that I was taking on religion and society. And we're reading these books. We were discussing all of these controversial issues. We were entering into the debate and suddenly in the middle of the lecture, he interrupted himself. And he said, based on my experience in pastoral ministry, he said, if if Catholics simply lived out the sacrament of matrimony for one generation, he said, 40 years from now, our whole society will have been converted. It would have been Christianized. He said, but I digress. And he went back to the lecture. And I didn't hear another word. I just latched onto that. Wow, if Catholics simply lived out the sacrament of matrimony, he's right. That's all it would take to unleash the grace that God would use to convince the world that he loves us just as we are, as sinners. But he loves us too much to leave us that way. But through the sacraments, and especially this one, he's going to bring us home. He's going to make us saints. And he's going to use us to draw others into the fullness of the faith. Because we're not out to win arguments privately with people who don't agree with us. We're not out to win arguments in the court. We're out to win brothers and sisters into the family of God. We're out to win sons and daughters for whom God the Father sent his son. Jesus didn't simply suffer and die for us Catholics. He did it for all humans. And so we've got to be willing to reach out to others in our marriages, in our family, in our neighborhood, in our parish, but also in the workplace. And through friendship, share the joy of what it means to discover that we were made for greatness. We were made for holiness. Not just to be good citizens in a great country, but to become saints in this royal family that is not merely human but divine. Not just on earth but in heaven. This is who we are. And this is why I'm convinced that the family of God fully alive is the only way to really reinvigorate our marriages and to bring the grace of conversion into our homes. It's what our kids have seen. They see it in their dad. They hear it all the time, but they've witnessed it in their mom. All six of our kids have seen the joy of the gospel lived out before them. And she's not always joyful, but what she does when she's not is to rediscover that, like I strive to as well. I want to lay this challenge before you, an invitation too, to see that the new evangelization has barely begun, that it represents not only our marching orders, but the greatest opportunity of a lifetime to become not only saints, but also to become living witnesses of the love of Christ in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
Amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of Christ. And in his name we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to come down upon us, to enlighten our minds with the word of your truth, to enkindle our hearts with the fire of your love, to touch us in the areas of deepest need, to strengthen us in the areas of the deepest and personal weaknesses that we have. Help us, O Lord, to acknowledge how much we need you. And then to convince us, O God, that you are able to meet our needs beyond our wildest dreams and to hear our prayers and to heal our homes and to reach us in ways that we don't even imagine possible. We also pray that you would empower us to go forth and to reach others. When we inhale the breath of your spirit, when we ingest the word made flesh in the Holy Eucharist, help us to go forth and to share that as freely and as fully as you have lavished it upon us. And I pray that you would also pour out your mercy upon those who are here, who have wounds, who have hardships, who have gone through difficulties, who are now going through dark times. They can't even talk about it with others, but you know it even better than they do. And so we pray for our brothers and sisters in deep need, for your beloved sons and daughters, that you would help them, that you would help all of us and hear us as we pray the family prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John Paul II, pray for us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.